Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. The cry for bread and roses continues across the Middle East. Afghan women still struggling for their right to an education. And Israeli forces attack Palestinian women challenging occupation policies. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Today, Lebanon and the world celebrated International Women's Day. So why is March 8th Women's Day? And what does it signify? Maho Tate reports. On March 8, 1908, thousands of women textile workers protested on the streets of New York under the slogan, Bread and Roses. They carried dry bread and roses, demanding shorter work hours, voting rights, and an end to child labor. This demonstration marked the start of the women's movement in the United States, especially after middle-class women joined the wave of demand for equality and justice. They adopted slogans demanding political rights and particular particularly voting rights. On May 8, 1909, National Women's Day was celebrated for the first time in commemoration of the protests in New York. In 1977, May 8 was declared International Women's Day. Journalist and poet Jumana Haddad says Women's Day belongs to every woman who was told by someone that she cannot, and she proved them wrong. For a lot of people, International Women's Day is linked to the illusion of celebrating a woman for being a woman. I view this as positive discrimination that I'm against. International Women's Day is a reminder of all the women and even men who fought for a better world for women, a more equal world, and those who are still struggling today. So it's a day to commend those people. It's the day of the woman who believes in her power and takes action. It's a cry to rise up and do something against the continued assault on women's dignity and even their most basic human rights by our patriarchal society. I believe it's a disgrace for Lebanon that its parliament still hasn't adopted a law that protects women from domestic violence. It makes me feel ashamed to be Lebanese. Many say it's strange that women are demanding their rights in Lebanon since they have received most of them, an argument that falters when faced with the United Nations report indicating that the largest number of crimes of honor worldwide takes place in Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Iraq and Palestine, pointing out that 66 murders were recorded between 1999 and 2007 in Lebanon, this being the most extreme type of violence against women. Today, women celebrate their International Day, which was proclaimed by the UN General Assembly. In observance, women's organizations and unions are exerting efforts to implement international treaties, calling for the protection of women's rights. They want the occasion to serve as a day for empowerment and not just be a celebratory day. Amani Al Nuri reports. In the beginning of March of every year, the world celebrates International Women's Day under the auspices of the United Nations, which dedicated March 8th to women in honor of their role in nation building and their effective participation in the development process. This day serves as an annual reminder of women's rights and the injustices they face. It's also a day to express support for all women around the world, living in war or in peace. Women's struggle is as old as history, with many of the international and regional treaties continuing to call for the protection of women through the enactment of laws, strategies, plans and programs. كذلك وضع أهداف جديدة تخدم هذه الغايات 
The contribution and involvement of women is the most important factor in the empowerment of society and the resolution of the most serious social, economic and political problems. March 8th comes as Palestinian women continue to be victimized by Israeli abuses and especially by the policy of detention. The number of Palestinian female prisoners, which has exceeded 15,000 over the years of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, has recently dropped. However, the amount of suffering they are enduring inside prison continues to rise. Hana al Shalabi, who entered her 23rd day of hunger strike to protest her arbitrary administrative detention, is a living proof of the ongoing Palestinian Palestinian women's battle for freedom. Our correspondent Mohammed Al Sayed reports from Ramallah. The struggle of Palestinian women against the Israeli occupation takes many forms. They sometimes bear arms to protect their lives, and at other times they work in their farmland just to make ends meet. But regardless, Palestinian women continue to pay a heavy price on a daily basis, as they're martyred, injured, and imprisoned, and mothers are bereaved. Meanwhile, Palestinian prisoner Hana al Shalabi decided to continue her struggle on a path of resilience and defiance. Sister Hana al Shalabi believes in the justice of her plight. This is why she is fighting her arbitrary detention, a type of punishment that is turned into an art form against the Palestinian people, including women, men, and children behind bars. Prisoner al Shalabi, despite the suffering she's enduring behind bars, is fighting this battle for freedom alone inside Israeli jails. She's defying the occupation's racist policies, laws, and injustice in a steadfast battle described as a legendary struggle. All human rights supporters are standing behind Hana al Shalabi in the fight for justice and as part of the struggle that was ignited by Khadr Adnan with the aim of abolishing administrative detention. Hana al Shalabi is sacrificing her body body and spirit for her plight and the right to freedom. Despite her deteriorating health, 30-year-old Al Shalabi decided to continue her open-ended hunger strike until her demands are met. This prompted prisoner and human rights organizations to issue an appeal urging the world to intervene and solve her case. Palestinian women have set a model for women across the world in the fight against occupation and powerful entities, and these women have not hesitated to pay the price. However, they refuse to surrender in the face of injustice and are using hunger strikes as a weapon, which is no longer limited just to men, as a weapon that may help to end the injustice, but at the same time threatens the life of its bearer. Several Palestinian women asphyxiated after the Israeli occupation forces fired tear gas and used water cannons to disperse a peaceful women's demonstration near Al Kalandia checkpoint, north of the occupied city of Jerusalem. Hundreds of Palestinian women organized a demonstration commemorating International Women's Day, during which they chanted slogans demanding an end to Israeli occupation and settlement reconstruction. They also called for an end to the administrative detention policy used against Palestinians. The women protesters also expressed their support for female prisoner Hana al Shalabi, who's been on an open-ended hunger strike for over three weeks in protest of her administrative detention. In Afghanistan, women suffer from many problems. Most notably, women are denied an education in many provinces due to the deteriorating security condition and tribal norms. Our reporter, Wali Ali Shaheen, observed the situation of women in southern Afghanistan's province of Kandahar. Nearly 800 girls study at this institute, which is funded by the Canadian government. In the city of Kandahar, girls risk their lives to secure their future in an attempt to change the reality of women living in southern Afghanistan, a reality created by the security situation and the social norms that are prevalent in the area. In this part of Afghanistan, women suffer a lot. For example, a girl here must convince her family to allow her to receive an education. The government is trying to do something. Girls' schools are available in the city, but they're in need of eligible employees to improve the situation of women. Girls who are able to go to schools, institutes and universities consider themselves lucky. 
It's a rarity for women to have the opportunity to study and gain knowledge despite the many girls' public schools in various Afghan cities. In contrast, schools are scarce in the villages and countryside. The biggest problem women face in the southern part of Afghanistan is that they are deprived from receiving an education. Whenever any girl tries to seek an education, she finds many obstacles in her way. They are attacked with burning acid and they are harmed on the road. And their families are also harassed, forcing girls to stay at home. It is dangerous for women to join the job market in Kandahar. Some were killed and others Others were threatened. Nevertheless, some women still challenge the reality and get a job to break the daily routine imposed by the reality of living in southern Afghanistan. The situation has become more complicated and more dangerous. Nobody feels safe. Everyone is thinking, will I make it home or will I be killed on the way? And which group is going to target me? We no longer only fear the Taliban and the foreign troops. When it comes to rights and responsibilities, equality between men and women is a subject that concerns many around the world. But in Afghanistan, everyone agrees that men and women are equal in the misery they share on a daily basis. Wali Ala Shaheen, Al Jazeera, Kandahar. In Saudi Arabia, reports say at least one female student of King Khalid University has been killed during a protest rally. The epileptic student died of a head injury on Wednesday. This as another student suffered a miscarriage when she was attacked by security forces and religious police. At least 53 students were injured when security forces clashed with female students there to protest discrimination, mistreatments and the lack of basic facilities. 29 university professors have resigned following the brutal attack on the female students. King Khalid University is located in the southwestern city of Abha. Students have been called on to hold a demonstration on Saturday demanding the resignation of the president of the university. Meanwhile, a Saudi vegetable vendor has set himself on fire to protest government injustice. Authorities arrested the street vendor where he plied his trade. He was being taken to the police station when he set himself on fire during a short stop at a gas station. The Daily Al Watan says the man's life has been saved. The protest action in the north of Saudi Arabia is reminiscent of Mohammed Abu Aziz's self emulation in January 2011 that sparked the revolution in Tunisia. Iran's ambassador to the International Atomic Energy Agency has once again denied allegations that Tehran is pursuing nuclear weapons. The truth is that Iran is not pursuing nuclear weapon. The truth is that whatever they have said so far during the last 10 years, that for the next couple of months Iran is testing a nuclear weapon, that it was not correct. The truth is that the sanctions have not had effect, any effect whatsoever on nuclear activities, including enrichment. In fact, the sanctions are targeting human beings and public rather than targeting centrifuge machines because we're producing every piece of... Dr. Ali Asghar Sultani also described recent allegations of nuclear activity at a military site in the capital, Tehran, as, quote, ridiculous. I said this is a ridiculous, childish story they are making out of something which is nothing. All our nuclear activities, of course, we have set under the IEA. And regarding the other matters, uh, we have been negotiating with IEA uh, regarding the annex of the report. Dr. Sultania called on the UN Security Council to condemn recent threats of military action against Iran's nuclear facilities by Israel. He accused Tel Aviv of violating the UN Charter. Iran's IAEA ambassador also said Tehran will continue to work with the atomic agency based on modality agreed in 2007. He made the remarks after a closed-door meeting of Nuclear Watchdog's Board of Governors in Vienna. Meanwhile, the 120 member states of the non-aligned movement, otherwise known as NAM, have once again voiced support for Iran's right to nuclear technology. The NAM statement stresses resolving Iran's nuclear issue through diplomacy and dialogue without any preconditions. NAM has also called on countries who claim to have evidence of possible militarization of Iran's nuclear program to present their findings. 
Nam's statements also refers to the IAEA chief's remarks that highlight non-diversion of Iran's nuclear activities. This comes after Tehran said it will allow the IAEA inspectors to visit a military site southeast of Tehran only if based on modality. In 2005, Tehran allowed the agency to visit the site twice. Following those visits, the IAEA confirmed Iran's non-diversion and said the case was closed. Open in Vienna, where the director of the International Atomic Energy Agency said that Iran is not being open about its nuclear program. This, as the UN's nuclear watchdog today, resumed debate over suspected nuclear weapon sites in Iran. More in this report from IBA's Aaron Viner. The governing board of the International Atomic Energy Agency convened for the third straight day as the agenda of the week long quarterly meeting was again dominated by Iran's disputed nuclear program. Agency head Yuhia Amano told CNN that there is great concern over undeclared facilities in the Islamic Republic. We have the indication or information that Iran uh, has engaged in activities relevant to the development of um, uh, nuclear explosive devices. Israel's representative Ehud Azalai will today address the IAEA over Jerusalem's demands that Iran immediately seize nuclear development. The U.S. representative is expected to urge more crippling sanctions be imposed as Iran's own delegate continues to maintain that all uranium enrichment in his country is for purely peaceful purposes, a position rejected by the U.N. nuclear watchdog organization. Uh, Iran is not um, telling us everything. That is my impression. We are asking Iran uh, to engage with us proactively and uh, Iran has a case to answer. After the two most recent UN investigatory missions were denied access to the Parchin military complex, Iranian leaders inexplicably offered access to the site where the UN agency believes high explosives research relevant to the development of nuclear weapons has been conducted. The five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany have agreed to a joint statement on the issue, with Russia notably participating in the isolation of Iran. European Union Foreign Policy Chief Catherine Ashton announced the P5 plus 1's acceptance of Iran's written agreement to reopen serious negotiations with the West, which could begin as early as next month. This is Aaron Viner for IBA News. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu still holds out hope that a military strike will not be needed in order to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons. In an interview with Fox News reporter Greta Van Susteren, the Prime Minister argues that Iran can be deterred from developing nukes when they realize that they face a credible threat, which paradoxically could eliminate the need for a military option. It sounds like war is inevitable. Oh, I, I don't think so. I mean, we've seen, uh, in fact, that Iran backed off from its nuclear program, its nuclear weapons program, um, really only once in the 15, 16 years that I've been uh, uh, warning the world about the dangers of a nuclear-armed Iran. And the only time they backed away was in 2003 when they thought there'd be a credible military threat against them. So in fact, the paradox is that if they actually believe that they're going to face the military option, you probably won't need the military option. دعا مفد الأمم المتحدة والجامعة العربية إلى سوريا كوفي أنان دعا إلى الوقف الفوري للقتل. The UN Arab League Joint Envoy to Syria, Kofi Annan, called for an immediate end to the killing and violence in Syria, warning that miscalculations of the situation in Syria may have an impact on the region. During press conference with Egyptian Foreign Minister Mohammed Kamal Amr, Annan urged the Syrian opposition to cooperate with them to reach a political solution to the Syrian crisis. On Saturday, Kofi Annan will start his mission to end the violence in Syria and seek a political solution to the crisis. He called on all parties of the Syrian opposition to work on meeting the Syrian people's aspirations and end the fighting and violence that has killed over 8,000 civilians since March 2011. The situation in Syria is very dangerous for the people and its repercussions will impact the entire region. The governments and nations of the world are deeply concerned over the escalation violence and lack of vision for a solution. The Syrian government must change its course in dealing with the matter. 
The Arab League reached a certain point that required it to appoint an envoy. Perhaps the brief statement by the Arab League Secretary General reassured Damascus and urged it to facilitate the mission of the joint envoy. And the best solution, as mentioned by Mr. Kofi Annan, is for there to be one effort for a solution. UN humanitarian chief Valerie Amos's statements after her visit to Baba Amer confirmed that the neighborhood is completely destroyed. She also said she heard gunfire in the neighborhood, even though it seemed devoid of its residents. Amos's statements are the first from a UN official visiting Syria. I was devastated by what I saw in Baba Amer. Arab foreign ministers are convening a meeting in Cairo on Saturday with the attendance of Russian foreign minister Sergei Lavrov. The Russian representative at the United Nations, who was among the first to recognize the opposition in Libya, accused Libya of not only training the armed Syrian opposition, but of also sending fighters to Syria. Damascus is protected by Moscow and China, which vetoed two Security Council resolutions on Syria. To find a solution to the crisis in Syria, China sent a delegation to the country and suggested a six-point proposal that addresses humanitarian concerns and proposes a dialogue. Damascus welcomed the proposal. So far, there still haven't been any international measures to halt the ongoing stream of such scenes. These are images of activists who appear to be injured. This is one of the many reasons pushing Syrian officials to defect and turn their backs on the regime. I join the revolution of this dignified people who did not and will not kneel down despite the brutality of the regime. International pressure is escalating, as is domestic pressure, while conflicting views dominate the debate on the Syrians' options. The outcome of Kofi Annan's visit to Syria may increase or reduce the possibility of adopting a military solution to solve the Syrian crisis. Hayan Yaqub, BBC. The Syrian Revolution's General Commission said security and army forces killed 11 people in a number of areas, mostly in Deir Zur and the countryside of Damascus. Opposition activists reported security forces launched a wide-scale campaign of raids and arrests in Al Qadam neighborhood of Damascus and set up checkpoints. Opposition activists in Homs said army forces shelled the Karam Zaytun neighborhood in Homs with heavy artillery and used tanks to attack Ma'arat al Naaman in Idlib. The Arab Network for Human Rights Information condemned the attack on the Emirati dissident Juma El Falasi by unidentified assailants in Dubai and accused security forces of being behind the operation. The condition of human rights in the United Arab Emirates remains controversial, and debates among many communities, organizations, and rights activists continue. Following the ongoing arrests and harassment of opposition figures, the Arab Network for Human Rights Information denounced the attack on Emirati dissident Juma al Falasi. Two people hit his car while he was driving and beat him, and then dragged him to a police station station, where he was also assaulted by police officers due to his criticism of the security and economic situation, as well as the crackdown on the opposition. In a similar incident, Emirati police arrested political activist Saleh al-Dafiri and raided his home on allegations he promoted ideas that caused strife and harmed national unity and social peace, as stated by the authorities. These incidents led Emirati activists to send open letters to the country's rulers, likening the crackdown by the security institutions to events in the dictatorships of Tunisia, Yemen, Iraq and Egypt. Yemeni military sources said hundreds of American soldiers and military experts arrived to Al Anad Air Base near Abiyan province in southern Yemen to supervise the fight against the so called terrorists in Yemen. The sources reported the American soldiers and military experts will supervise and participate in recovering Zinjibar City and other areas controlled by armed groups that Yemeni authorities say are close to Al Qaeda. 
al-Qaeda. The U.S. Air Force launched a number of attacks on Yemeni cities and villages. The revolutionary parties in Yemen accused the U.S. and Saudi Arabia of exploiting the al-Qaeda issue to justify their interference in Yemen's affairs. Today, Yemen is witnessing a series of demonstrations and marches called for by the revolutionaries with the aim of reaffirming that the revolution will continue until there is regime change. The March of Glory, launched from the Yemeni capital Sana, headed to the city of Taiz, vowing to continue the Yemeni revolution. Revolutionaries and political figures took part in the march, stressing their rejection of the Riyadh Agreement, which aimed to abort the Yemeni revolution at its infancy in favor of Saudi and U.S. plans and agendas. Participants pledged to achieve the goals of the revolution, clarifying their departure from Sana'a was the result of the restrictions and harassments that were imposed on them after the initiative was signed. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.